next was the following, a story about uh, a preacher, an Anglican preacher, very famous one, who w walked through all the villages in England preaching. And when he arrived to villages, he f the first thing he did was to ring the bell of the church and to call the people to listen his sermon. And he went to a village, he rang the bell, and nobody came. He rang the bell again, and repeatedly, and again nobody came. After a while, he saw a person coming from a long distance, walking very slowly, approaching the church. He waited for him. It, he was a peasant. He sat in the church alone, and he was in the dilemma to preach or not to preach. And he said, let me, let me ask the peasant what, what he thinks about this. He went to him. He said, what do you think? Should I preach to you? You are the only one who came from the whole village. And the peasant said, well, father, I don't know. I'm an illiterate peasant. I cannot read. I don't understand things. The only thing I do is to feed my cows. But I know that when I go to feed my cows and only one cow comes, I do not let her go uh, hungry. You know, the, uh, the, 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 the preacher was insulted. He was angry. He said, look, this peasant, what he's talking to me. He's making fun of me. And he came up to the ambo and started his best. And he preached the best sermon he knew with hands moving and so on. And then he came down. Now, let's see what the peasant says about this sermon. He went again to the peasant. What do you think now about the sermon? He said, I don't know. I'm an illiterate uh, peasant. And the only thing I know is to feed my cows. But you know, Father, when the only cow comes, I do not give all the food that I have for all cows. <laughs> uh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks to uh, Father Bibathoros for a very thought-provoking and um, a challenging uh, speech. Three things that I take um, from his presentation is the interface uh, between uh, religion, ethics, and uh, science in the form of the sanctity of personhood, which is not much different than respect for human rights. Uh, the sanctity of person's free will, and um, how love thy neighbor as a Christian imperative or dictum could also mean respect your neighbor and respect uh, the earth's resources that uh, feeds you. And uh, I'm very happy that all these uh, three dicta uh, direct us to the merits of uh, sustainability. Now, as regards the uh, interface between modern biotechnology and religion, which is a very difficult field, I will leave that to John Harris, Peter Lackman, and the other experts uh, like Inez in the panel. And uh, on that happy note, I'd like to open the floor to questions. Annabelle. It would be, yeah. Um, I've got a question for Professor Lackman, and also may I a comment? The question was such an interesting talk. And right at the end, you said that the decline in population over the past, the past generation, really, has been influenced by two things. One's the education of women, and the other was affluence. And you suggested, I think very provokingly, that efforts now to sort of rein in affluence a bit might turn out to be counterproductive. And I wanted to press you on that and to ask whether you meant we should rein it in or whether the idea was the redistribution of opportunities for affluence to some extent was the critical factor. And I had a slight comment because listening to you on religion and especially the importance of its prohibitions reminded me enormously of Durkheim and the elementary forms of the religious life. I know anthropologists are very puzzled. They don't really like it anymore. It's gone out of fashion because of the idea that Aboriginal tribes in Australia are going to tell us something about the elementary forms of religion. Now it seems like a mistaken idea. But in so many respects, your talk seemed incredibly Durkheimian. And as someone who feels that Durkheim actually got the short end of the stick, that people appreciate Weber far too much and Durkheim too little, 
I was hoping perhaps that you might want to draw on a wonderful example of Durkheim next time you, you present your ideas. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Durkheim um, and Weber, I will leave to John Harris, actually. Um, I think in prison company, I won't discuss with others. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't say that the human population had gone down. I said the projections for future growth had decreased, and it is believed, um, this was based on the study that the Royal Society did with the Indian Academy, the first thing that the Inter-Academy panel ever did, that the education of women and an improvement in standards of life that people, in fact, had wish to do other things than simply to uh, have increasingly large families, and also not to need uh, increasing number of children just in order to be able to live. In other words, that they should have um, old age pensions, they should have farm machinery, um, all these things which actually make life more affluent. Um, and I think that the idea that we should which is not what John Sulston said, but um, which a number of other people say, that we should all actually go back to being sort of hunter-gatherers um, in a view that we can have more people using less resources, I think is A, completely unrealistic, and secondly, also quite undesirable. And I think that this is one of the reasons that population is so important, is I really don't think there is much future in a world where we are trying to live an increasingly simple life in the form that people look back at past centuries as if it was a golden past instead of a time when life was brutish and short and full of disease and unpleasantness. And I do actually want to make one other point, which is when people say, and somebody said this morning, that most of the problem about overconsumption is in the highly developed world, I think one also has to be slightly careful about that. The first consequence of persuading the United States to reduce their enormous energy inputs into agriculture would not be to make the United States farmers poor, it would be to create enormous starvation in large parts of the third world, which rely entirely on food imports from the United States and now from one or two other overproducing countries in order to be able to feed themselves. Um, so I think one has to think of the consequences a bit too. But the, uh, I take what you say about Dirk. I mean, I'll have a supervision about this from John Harris in due course. Thank you. I'm as nervous about these things as you are. Is that working? Oh, good. Um, thanks to um, all the speakers and panelists for a very um, interesting opening session. I think what was highlighted for me particularly uh, by the two keynote talks is the vast gap between what we talk about at the level of individual behaviour, as John Harris was saying, our tendency to want to make ourselves better and to have better lives for ourselves, and group behaviour, where, um, as, as I think Inez highlighted, sometimes what is good for the, the group is not what is good for the individual. Perhaps we have to be greed dehanced. We have to lose some of our greed and our individual wanting to be better in order to make the world a better place, to make life better for a group. What I would like the panel to comment on is the, this idea that perhaps moral enhancement for, for individuals, making us better, might actually require us having to give some things up. And particularly, I want to ask the question whether you think that um, either now or in the past, religion has ever been a moral enhancement that can do that for us. Uh, well, <laughs> a, a general question to the panel. Um, Thank you for this, which gives me the opportunity to share some other shots, uh, thoughts that we had this morning for, with some of you. Um, for I, cannot talk, I can talk only for the Orthodox Church and theology, of course. For us, ethical codes are uh, general and can never be scholastic. Uh, what I mean with that? For ex I can g g talk with examples which are easier to, to share. For example, the use of condoms. 
uh, for the Orthodox Church, this has never been an issue, the use or not of condoms. Because we think that this question is a scholastic question and has no place for the, or an Orthodox theologian uh, or for a patriarch to issue an encyclical or to issue a book with ethical codes which can contain these kind of details for the faithful to follow or not. Uh, the use of condoms is uh, led uh, to the common sense and free understanding of each uh, faithful who has the common sense uh, and can use it when it is needed to be used. I can give you another example uh, with the protection of the environment. For the first time, the Orthodox Church, through the Ecumenical Patriarch Bartholomew, announced a, a very um, um, openly with an encyclical that the pollution of the environment, for example, is considered a sin. And this is official, and this is something new. And this is a new way of understanding uh, the, uh, the role of the religion and the churches particularly uh, to the new challenges that humanity faces today. Uh, these are voice activated, wonderful. Technology uh, strikes again. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I ought to be drawn on whether uh, abandoning religion would or would not be a moral advance, but I was struck um, in the bishop's presentation by how personally biographical it was, that it was full of this is what we believe and this is what Orthodox Christians believe. And it struck me that this at best could only have appeal to people who shared those beliefs. And it seems to me that if we are to try to achieve uh, consensus, particularly in democracies, it is important that arguments be couched in, in terms that ought to be persuasive to a rational mind. That is to say, that ought to be of general appeal rather than appeal only to particular groups of individuals who already accept a particular doctrine or a particular way of life or indeed a particular um, set of uh, folk habits or whatever it happens to be. So I, my own feeling is that it's it, it's, I feel slightly unnerved where effectively we have a presentation which is a very interesting piece of personal biography, facts about the particular speaker, but not really designed to be of appeal to anyone who doesn't already share that set of beliefs. Just a, short, just a short comment. And you, you, <laughs> you are right, of course, it was like this, because uh, I cannot speak for others, uh, and my, uh, my uh, task was to present to you the Orthodox aspect of personhood as seen by the Orthodox Church, um, which, of course, is not accepted by all, and well, this is respected as well. Uh, you are right. Thank you. Yadis, who I have to say would have been with us as a speaker today if we hadn't been given the wrong uh, email address and um, we feel honored to have him among us in the audience and definitely as a keynote speaker in another function. Professor Magnet. Thank you for the comment. I have a comment for first for uh, Professor Harris concerning enhancement. Of course, Human civilization is, an, uh, is from the beginning an, emf an effort to enhance human skills and abilities. But uh, we should not confuse uh, uh, <coughs> the various forms of enhancement. I would like to uh, concentrate on enhancement by medical means. 